the British economy is in free fall and neither the Prime Minister nor the Chancellor are anywhere to be seen. It's a, the equivalent of hiding in a fridge while the markets are crashing. So what the hell is going on? I'll be speaking to an economist and former city trader to find out. Also tonight, Labour are 17 points ahead in the polls, but what kind of Prime Minister would Keir Starmer be? We'll decode his conference speech. I'm joined by Dahlia Gabriel, back from Liverpool. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I always feel better when I come back from Liverpool. It's an amazing uh, city, but I have to say the drop in temperature has got me like really, really screwed up. I hate it. I don't belong in these climates. I was not meant for this. <laughs> I need to send a couple of emails and get myself some Navara branded sweatshirts because yeah, the studio is also getting pretty chilly. And um, we do want to know your comments and your questions throughout the show. How worried are you about the pound falling? about the cost of government borrowing increasing and are you now a convert to the woke IMF? Um, if you're not aware of what that refers to, that will be, um, or that will all become clear very soon. The reaction to Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget could hardly have been worse. First, the pound collapsed and the cost of borrowing soared. Then the American and German treasuries expressed their disquiet before the IMF joined in. And now the Bank of England has had to make the emergency announcement that it will directly buy government debt in order to avoid market collapse. So what does it all mean? All quite confusing. Let's start with the statement from the International Monetary Fund. So they are the organization tasked with maintaining international financial stability. They said this, we are closely monitoring recent economic developments in the UK and are engaged with the authorities. Given elevated inflation pressures in many countries, including the UK, we do not recommend large and untargeted fiscal packages at this juncture, as it is important that fiscal policy does not work at cross-purposes to monetary policy. The nature of UK measures will likely increase inequality. The November 23rd budget will present an early opportunity for UK government to consider ways to provide support that is more targeted and re-evaluate the tax measures, especially those that benefit high-income earners. So that is basically the IMF saying they think both the energy package and the proposed tax cuts are bad because they will be inflationary. Their additional complaint about the energy policy is that it's untargeted and they critique the cut to the top rate of tax as increasing inequality. Now it's worth noting the IMF doesn't really care about poverty rates in Britain. They don't tend to care about inequality. So why in this instance did they feel the need to intervene? Well, key here is the pace at which UK government bonds were losing their value. Government bonds are what the government sell to fund their own spending, and they were losing value because investors had lost confidence in UK policymaking. Now, that matters to financial instability or to financial stability because lots of big financial institutions and pension funds hold those bonds as supposedly stable assets. If those assets tank in value, those institutions have a problem. This was Yanis Varoufakis's take. The good news from the British perspective is that you know, the United Kingdom is not a Greece. Uh, you issue the currency in which you borrow your money, and that is a great uh, advantage to have. So you're not in Argentina, you're not a Greece, but at the same time, it is perfectly possible that this a momentous error by the, the, the trust government can create a domino effect that will bring down uh, the treasury market, the public debt market in the United States, and that would be a calamity for the United States and for you know, global capitalism. This is why the IMF stepped in. It was not just one of those IMF interventions, you know, pointing fingers at uh, recalcitrant governments in emerging markets. So in short, what he's saying, unlike Greece or Argentina, our government won't default. That's because we borrow in our own currency. But the fall in the value of UK government bonds or government debt could still do serious damage. So what happened next? So after that intervention from the IMF, the Bank of England stepped in. This is what they announced just before lunchtime today. The bank is monitoring developments in financial markets very closely in light of the significant repricing of UK and global financial assets. This repricing has become more significant in the past day and is particularly affecting long-dated UK government debt. 
were dysfunction in this market to continue or worse, and there would be a material risk to UK financial stability. This would lead to an unwarranted tightening of financing conditions and a reduction of the flow of credit to the real economy. In line with its financial stability objective, the Bank of England stands ready to restore market functioning and reduce any risks from contagion to credit conditions for UK households and businesses. To achieve this, the bank will carry out temporary purchases of long-dated UK government bonds from the 28th of September. The purpose of these purchases will be to restore orderly market conditions. The purchases will be carried out on whatever scale is necessary to affect this outcome. So put simply here, the fall in the value of government bonds threatened financial instability. So the Bank of England has promised to buy as many bonds as is necessary to shore up their value in the market. These purchases will be funded by essentially printing money, which the bank has the right to do. It's a big move. And Ed Conway at Sky had this information on why the bank felt the need to act with such urgency. So he says, on the Bank of England intervention, I'm told the Bank of England were responding to a run dynamic on pension funds, a wholesale equivalent of the run which destroyed Northern Rock. Had they not intervened, there would have been mass insolvencies of pension funds this afternoon. If by this point you're a little overwhelmed by wonky economic language, never fear. I'm joined by economist and former market trader Gary Stevenson to make it all make sense. Gary, thank you so much for coming back on the show. First of all, um, from first principles, what is a government bond? Okay, the first thing to understand is when the government borrows money, it it borrows money from people, from things like pension funds, from wealthy individuals. And when you lend money to the government, you get a government bond. Uh, And basically, that's tradable. So I can lend money to the government and then sell the government bond, and then somebody else will be owed the money. So essentially, it's a tradable IOU from the government. So why has there been this movement in the market where the value of British government bonds has dramatically decreased? It's completely a response to the, the announcement from the government, basically. So if you look at what the government has done, you know, in the last three years, there's been a massive, massive increase in government debt. Um, but that was a one-off emergency because of COVID. And now, suddenly, out of nowhere, the government has decided that they're going to do this bonfire on taxes of the richest. You know, um, Traders look at that and they basically think, okay, well, if you're not going to tax the rich people who have all the wealth, you're you're not going to be able to to pay the debt back. And that basically leads to sort of, essentially, the reason governments can take large debts is because the economy grows and because there's inflation. When inflation happens, it devalues the debt and makes it easy to pay back. Traders and economists don't believe this is going to have any growth. So they're saying, really, the government is going to have to do one of two things, which is not pay the debt back or create inflation. And they sell the pound because if there's going to be inflation, pounds are worth less. That means there will be inflation because when the pound collapses, in, imports become more expensive, which means the central bank, who has a job to control inflation, will then have to raise rates. And markets are expecting a massive increase in interest rates. So traders, they look at the central bank and they think, well, these guys are going to raise rates massively. So why am I going to hold government bonds that give me 3% when the central bank is expected now to raise rates to 5 6 or even 7%? It seems like the big event that sort of forced the Bank of England to make this dramatic intervention um, was the potential for a run dynamic on pension funds. So what would, what would a run dynamic on pension funds be? Why would that be caused by a loss of value in government bonds? OK, so let's explain this from basics. OK, so obviously lots of people have money in a pension and a big investment that a lot of pension funds do is to buy government bonds. Now, some pension funds, in order to sort of boost their buck and get a little bit more bank for their money, they borrow money to buy even more government bonds. So that way you you can borrow cheaply, you buy more government bonds, you can get a little bit extra return. Um, Now in the last, especially in the last month, but in the whole of the last year, because interest, Bank of England interest rates have been rising, the value of bonds have been steadily falling because now interest rates have been nearly zero for the last 10, 15 years. That means that a lot of these bonds have very, very low interest rates. Now, if the central bank is going to start paying three, four, five, six percent on cash, you don't want to be holding a zero interest government bond. So traders have been selling these government bonds. Pension funds who have borrowed money to buy loads of government bonds are suddenly in a situation where you've borrowed a million quid, you've bought a million quid of government bonds, and those bonds are only worth 900,000, 800,000 pounds now. So the people who lent the money are turning around to them and saying, okay, well, we need you to front up some more money because we don't, 
we don't trust you anymore because the assets you hold are not worth enough. Well, then that means the pension funds to pay that money have to sell the bonds, which drives the bond price down even further. And you can get this vicious spiral where institutions such as pension funds continually have to sell the asset in order to pay back the debt, which drives the price further and further down and, and the price keeps falling and these institutions can go bankrupt. And so they, they call that the doom loop, don't they? So the value is falling, so they have to sell it to convert it to cash. That makes the value fall even more. So then they have to, they, they need to sell it more. And then, and the Bank of England's intervention was to try and stop this doom loop happening. So the Bank of England, they have the power to print lots of money and they've intervened. They've said, look, if no one wants to buy these bonds, so the, uh, the price is falling, what we're going to do is we're going to buy loads of them. That will push up demand. That will push up the price to a point where these pension funds aren't in, in danger. Um, Makes sense. You know, if, if, if you're the one institution that can very easily print money and intervene in the market, I can see why they've done it. Is, is there a problem here? Why should we or should we be worried that the Bank of England has printed a load of money to buy government bonds? I mean, th this goes back to the thing I've been saying a lot whenever I've done media in the last couple of years, right, which is whenever the Bank of England prints a ton of money, especially when it's a lot of money, and whenever the government gives out a lot of money, you need to be asking where that money is going to end up. So essentially, what we have here is a situation where the government has slashed taxes on rich people. This is after the three years which have seen the biggest and fastest ever increase in millionaire and billionaire wealth in the country. Okay, The government has now slashed taxes on them. The market has said, well, we think that's, that makes you financially unsustainable. So we're basically going to pull the plug on you. And the Bank of England is basically coming in and funding it. So now you have a situation where the Bank of England is essentially funding a massive cash transfer from the government to the rich on the back of the biggest ever cash transfer we've ever seen from the government to the rich. And I want to put some numbers on this, you know, because I think it's amazing. I don't think people realize, you know, if you were to tax the wealthy enough now to make them as rich as they were before COVID started, you could give every single adult in the country 12,000 pounds. And that is before the energy stimulus, which is another 150 billion pounds to the energy companies. And before the massive tax cuts for millionaires. So what you're seeing here is a continuation of a systemic issue where the government and the central bank together are pumping hundreds of billions of pounds to the rich. And the consequence for ordinary people is that prices go up and inflation goes up and ordinary people start the living decreases. You know, you cannot expect to see the fastest ever increase in inequality in the history of the country and not see living standards for ordinary people fall. So, so I really want people to push back against this. And I want your thoughts on the IMF. So, you know, historically, when the IMF have come up on Navarra Media, it would be to critique them. They normally, you know, thought of as an institution that enforces free market policies on countries. What they normally want to do is cut spending. And IMF programs normally dramatically increase um, inequality, especially in, in debtor countries. So you might think of Argentina or, or Greece or many countries in, in Africa and Asia over the years. Why are they suddenly concerned about inequality? Why have the IMF released a statement which says we've got a problem with what Kwasi Kwarteng has announced because it will increase inequality? Plainly and simply, because people are looking at the, what the government is doing now and thinking that it is completely insane. It is completely unsustainable. You, you cannot run massive deficits permanently. It's... And, you know, normally when you see countries try and do this, run really big deficits for a long term, it's because of some sort of external disaster or some sort of really serious situation which requires an immediate stimulus. You know, for example, COVID. Now you've got a government that is trying to do this purely in the service of giving an absolute ton of money to millionaires. I mean, I'm talking to traders in the city and the, the biggest question here is, is what do they think they are doing? And, it, you know, we're torn between working out, are they crazy or are they stupid? And, and the IMF is thinking, that, you know, I've been in markets for a long time. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anybody tear their country's finances apart for something as ridiculous as a massive injection of cash to the richest people in the country. I've never seen anybody do it. And, and it's, it's not just me. It's me, the IMF. It's everybody in the markets just looking at these guys and asking them, what, what are they trying to do? It's crazy. And what should happen now? I mean, I've said the prime minister, the chancellor, are uh, you know nowhere to be seen. They they seem to be a bit flummoxed. It seems like they're kind of rabbits in headlights. They didn't realise that their announcement on Friday would cause such a dramatic reaction. I mean, what what could they do to stabilise the markets, or are they just going to you know keep quiet and hope the Bank of England sort of does the hard work for them? 
Okay, something has to give here. And the reason that something has to give is because in the last week, we've seen a massive increase in interest rates. And that is going to cause an enormous increase in the interest rates of mortgages. Okay, so, you know, mortgages in the last years have been pretty low. You know, people have been getting mortgages one and a half, two percent. In the next couple of years, if, if nothing is done to, to deal with this, mortgage rates are going to go up to six, seven, eight percent. It's just completely unsustainable, given the level of house prices and the size of people's mortgages, especially young people who have bought recently, who have very large mortgages. There's no way they can afford these. On top of the increase in energy prices, the increase in food prices, this is literally going to be another, this could be in many cases, an extra £1,500 a month. People don't have that. So something has to give, and it's very difficult to understand what, because if the government is going to do this and interest rates will be high like that. It's as simple as that. And, it, and it's politically unsustainable. So either the government has to back down, which, you know, they're stubbornly saying they won't, but I think it's, it's quite possible in the end they may be forced to, or they need to force the central bank to massively support them to keep interest rates low, despite the fact that inflation is probably going to be very high. So in that case, what you'll probably see is, is another big increase in inflation and a collapse in the pound. So there's no good options here other than the government backing down and, you know, we need to do whatever we can to try and force them to do that. So something's got to give. You're in agreement with the IMF. Everything's getting very strange, all very topsy-turvy. Gary, thank you so much um, for your insight today. We'll get you back on soon, I'm sure. And everyone in our audience, you can check out Gary's YouTube channel, which we've linked to in the description box below. Lots of great explainers of very complicated economics. We're going to go, well, I say we're going to go into the politics of this, but it's, it's actually more important than the politics of this, because this is really how this could affect all of us, um, especially in, in the medium term. Um, and this is a development that Sam Coates from Sky has reported on today. So he tweets, why at all to be told to find efficiency savings as well as refusing to reopen spending review? Chris Philp to write to secretaries of state within hours. So Chris Philp works in the treasury uh, or minister in the treasury. What efficiency savings are there given levels of inflation? Amazing bull, said a Whitehall source. Um, Dahlia, I want your thoughts on this one. So it seems that what we're facing now, the government have announced a load of unfunded tax cuts. The markets have freaked out because the government looks like it's going to borrow loads of money for no particular reason and doesn't have any plan as to how it's going to pay it back. And lo and behold, what we're going to see is the government say, oh, no, we know um, how we're going to pay for these tax cuts. It's going to be spent, it's cuts to public services. So is that what we're about to see? And I suppose relatedly, will people accept it this time? I can't really see this, this landing well with people. We've often say, you know, public services are being cut to the bone. The NHS is being cut to the bone. There's n there's no flesh left to trim off. Do you know what I mean? Like there's no fat left to trim off. Like at this point, you are just breaking the bones of public services. And I think it's really important to also acknowledge that real austerity, ne real terms austerity never really ended uh, despite announcements to the contrary. And it's important to understand here that austerity is not actually a crisis response. Um, it's an economic ideology. It is the ideology of people disproportionately represented, obviously, in the Conservative Party, that public services should be underfunded, that wealth should not be distributed evenly or fairly, uh, but rather, you know, concentrated and redistributed towards the top. These are people whose political ideology, uh, whose economic ideology is, regardless of the conditions of the economy, is against collectivism of any kind. Uh, things like the NHS, things like social housing, these aren't concepts that they are in favor of, but find themselves in a situation where they have to, to cut these services. They are ideologically opposed to the idea of a safety net. Let's remember, you know, these are all Thatcherites. They don't believe in society. They believe just in individuals. They believe that removing the levers that people rely on, whether it's housing or healthcare or education, that by removing those levers, you are making people pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It is an ideology that is political, economic, social. Uh, and it, it exists regardless of whether there's a crisis or not. Uh, so we have to see austerity not as just this misguided response to economic crisis, but as a pre-existing 
economic and social and political ideology that is more easily implemented or an easier sell during times of crisis because crisis kind of provides that narrativistic justification. Uh, but as to your argument about whether or not people are going to take it this time, well, when we think about 2008, 2008 kind of took the economy by surprise. Not, not all economists, a lot of economists also did see and know that, know that there's a boom and bust cycle uh, to, to capitalism. But it took civil society for sure as a surprise, ad, as did uh, austerity economics. We're in a very different context now. You know, we have an already pretty strong movement in terms of enough is enough and the don't pay movement. We see union membership and union organizing at a much higher level now than it was in 2008. So we're entering a very different landscape. And I hope that that will mean that this rollout of austerity or this attempted re, you know, re-escalation of austerity, let me say, rather than reintroduction of austerity, that this attempt to escalate austerity um, will be met with far more of an organized and prepared fight back. The political argument, I think, is just much harder to make this time around for the government. Before, obviously, it was a lie, but they could plausibly say, oh, the problem was the overspending of the Labour government, which led to the financial crisis, and therefore we need to we need to make these cuts. It was nonsense in terms of real economics, but at least it was sort of a narrative story that did stick together. That's one of the reasons it was effective. Now, I mean, everyone has seen that this crisis happened after they gave a massive tax cut to the really, really rich. So they cut... You know, what are they What are they going to do? I mean, as we're going to see later in the show, some are trying to blame it on a future Labour government, um, but I don't think that's going to stick either. I just want to highlight um, a, a development this afternoon, which I think shows how insane it is to be suggesting that departments need to make efficiency savings. Um, Sean Linton, who is the health editor at the Sunday Times, has tweeted, Nottingham hospitals declare a critical incident, probably Nottinghamshire Hospital, sorry, declare a critical incident as it experiences 97% occupancy and 720 A&E attendances. He says, so it begins. So it's important to note, we're still in September, right? Normally when you get these, I mean, we shouldn't get them at all. We should have a healthcare system that can handle any month of the year. But normally these are the kind of things we see when it gets to January, February, saying, oh, the hospital is at a breaking point. We are already in September, you know, we're at the very beginning of a new COVID wave. We're expected to see big flu waves this winter. COVID obviously takes out a lot of staff as well. And we already have critical incidents in hospitals in September. So ask them for efficiency savings. How, where are they going to find those efficiency savings? Keir Starmer's speech at the Labour Party conference was a mixed bag. He talked about aspiration and optimism, but there were also the clearest signals yet that Starmer's interest is strictly in the centre ground. Let's start with the more positive policy announcements, though, which suggested a serious effort to tackle climate change. Today, I'm so proud to launch our Green Prosperity Plan, a plan that will turn the UK into a green growth superpower. And driving the plan forward is a goal that will put us ahead of any major economy in the world. 100% clean power by 2030. An effort that will double Britain's onshore wind capacity, treble solar power, quadruple offshore wind, invest in tidal, hydrogen, nuclear, back carbon capture, commit to green steel production, new renewable ports, new gigafactories, and insulate 19 million homes. This will require a different way of working. The biggest partnership between government, business, and communities this country has ever seen. It will mean new jobs, more than a million new jobs. Training for plumbers, electricians, engineers, software designers, technicians and builders. It will all start within the first 100 days of a new Labour government. A new British Sovereign Wealth Fund will drive us forward on this mission. We will make sure that the public money we spend building up British industry spurs on private investment, stimulates growth in construction, life sciences, finance and insurance and the British people enjoy the returns. We won't make the mistake the Tories made with North Sea oil and gas back in the 1980s when they frittered away the wealth from our national resources. Just look at what's happening at the moment. The largest onshore wind farm in Wales. Who owns it? Sweden. Energy bills in Swansea are paying for schools and hospitals in Stockholm. 
The Chinese Communist Party has a stake in our nuclear industry. And five million people in Britain pay their bills to an energy company owned by France. So we will set up great British energy within the first year of a Labour government. A new company that takes advantage of the opportunities in clean British power. And because it is right for jobs, because it is right for growth, because it is right for energy independence from tyrants like Putin, then yes, conference, great British energy will be publicly owned. So there were three ideas there. First, massive investment in renewable energy technologies with the target of completely green energy by 2030. That's pretty ambitious. Then the second idea is to create a state-owned startup, Great British Energy, that will own those technologies and generate energy from them. And the third idea is that the profits generated by those investments and that energy will be ploughed back into a Norway-style sovereign wealth fund. Um, Dahlia, we are going to go on to the parts of Starmer's speech we might be more critical of in one moment. First of all, what did you think of um, those announcements there? Are they a big deal? Should they be taken seriously? Uh, I mean, I think that a lot of it is uh, broadly fine. Uh, Decarbonising our energy system by 2030, obviously hugely important and necessary. And we can thank climate movements like Labour for a Green New Deal for really making, forcing the demand to be 2030 rather than 2050, which would be uh, a death sentence for for millions around the world. Uh, I think that, the, you know, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, it's a good corrective to the privatising of costs and the the privatizing of gains and socializing of costs that we've seen as the governing principle of our energy system for decades. Uh, I don't know what a state-owned startup is. Uh, it sounds like something that a very corny messaging specialist was paid a lot of money to come up with. Uh, I think it's much better to actually just argue for public ownership and convince people of public ownership rather than to kind of rebrand it as something else and hope that, you know, no one will notice. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the key thing here is that unlike previous iterations of Starmerism, uh, we are actually seeing some lines being drawn in the sand uh, between a Labour vision and a Tory vision, you know, at a time when uh, Truss and Reese mogg are talking about, you know, increasing the number of oil projects, increasing fracking, squeezing every last drop of oil from the North Sea, it's the bare minimum we can expect is that a Labour Party will be sitting in contrast uh, with that. But our expectations have been lowered so much that it is a, somewhat of a shift and somewhat of a surprise. Uh, I think a lot of this, this uh, pressure to, that has resulted in this is coming partly internally. I think particularly, I have a feeling from, you know, an Ed Miliband maybe as he's kind of quite... Uh, up to date and and yeah, like more in touch with movements about the the climate stuff. Uh, and of course, it's coming externally from things like the Don't Pay campaign, from Enough Is Enough, uh, etc. But crucially, you know, these climate policies are not the kind of transformative and holistic Green New Deal policies that we have seen in previous Labour Party manifestos. It's much more of a top-down state intervention process to try and kind of manage capitalism a little bit better. It's very much about, you know, not transforming our energy markets, but just sort of tinkering around the edges, which which is not enough. Um, it's not enough for the scale of crisis that climate breakdown uh, represents. And I think that what's more indicative of the kind of approach, what has been consistent throughout this entire thing, throughout the entire era of Starmer that is also represented here, is that despite these major policy announcements being climate-based, the actual movements uh, on the ground that are organizing around this, I'm thinking, you know, of Labour for a Green New Deal here, have been entirely shut out from the process. You know, Labour for a Green New Deal were, were not allowed to debate their conference motion. Uh, it's this very 
top-down, anti-democratic approach to explicitly basically make sure that no movement can ever be built in conjunction with what's happening at the top of the party. And that's to make sure that you never have a situation where, you know, the movement can push the party or challenge the party or create space uh, for the party to move into kind of more radical uh, action. And frankly, things as ambitious as decarbonizing our, our, our energy system by 2030 is not going to happen without the buy-in of climate movements, of civil society movements, and most importantly, of labor movements. And that kind of attempt to, to force it on top down means that especially if we wait until 2024 for a labor government giving us six years to, de to decarbonize our energy system, it's just not the kind of power that needs to be built in order to do that. Yeah, I suppose, you know, one thing that some people on the left are disappointed about, you know, nothing's getting nationalised here. So what's being proposed is they're going to create a new company um, that is going to invest and create energy. So the energy companies, which, you know, essentially Keir Starmer promised he would nationalise in his leadership election, they're, they're going to continue as they are. Um, so you can see how it's, it's sort of a policy which is progressive, yeah, but it's not going to win him any enemies um, in, in the business world. And you can make... Um, whatever you you want from that. Because he's Keir Starmer, there were also policies based on the kind of ideas that impress soft Tories and the right of the Labour Party. I've seen home ownership rise almost my entire life. It's the bedrock of security and aspiration. That pebble dash semi meant everything to my family. But now, under the Tories... The dream of owning your own home is slipping away for too many. And that's a political choice. Because if you keep inflating demand without increasing supply, house prices will only rise and homes become less affordable for working people. So, so we will set a new target, 70% home ownership. And we will meet it with a new set of political choices, a Labour set of political choices. No more buy-to-let landlords or second homeowners getting in first. We will back working people's aspirations. Help first-time buyers onto the ladder with a new mortgage guarantee scheme. Reform planning so speculators can't stop communities getting shovels in the ground. My message is this. If you're grafting every hour to buy your own home, Labour is on your side. Labour is the party of home ownership in Britain today. I will make work pay for people who create this country's wealth. I will make sure we buy, make and sell more in Britain. I will revitalise public services and control immigration using a points-based system. I will spread power and opportunity to all our communities. And I will never be shy to use the power of government to help working people succeed. But Labour will make Brexit work. Labour will deliver change. And you'll never get that from the Tories. It was that policy on housing that I think I found particularly disappointing, and especially that target to get 70% of the country as homeowners. Because what's a side note there, what just becomes a side issue is renters. And if you're going to have 70% of the country as homeowners, you're going to have 30% who are renters. And what we have had for the past you know, few decades, ever since the sort of start of the 1980s, is that the people who dictate government policy are homeowners. That means homeowners um, get tax incentives. It's cheaper to have a mortgage than it is to rent. There's been all of these um, benefits going to buy to let landlords. I know Keir Starmer is saying they won't get first dibs on houses. But one of the most sort of Weasley policies I always find is when politicians say, oh, local people will get the first chance to buy these houses or local people will get the first chance to rent these houses. Well, if you can't afford them, getting the first chance doesn't mean very much. So to me, this is disappointing because essentially I think we're moving into a situation. I think at the moment you've got about 65% of the population are homeowners. The number of renters is growing. On one level, that is the symptom of a defunct housing market, house prices being incredibly expensive. At the other end of the spectrum or sort of on the other hand, it's actually an opportunity because if the number of renters in the population is growing, maybe finally we can move away from a system where housing policy is all geared towards homeowners, which I think inevitably ends up with this sort of speculative race where you've got governments who are terrified of house prices falling and then renters get screwed over. So if I was Keir Starmer there, what I'd want him to be focusing on is making 
yeah, let's make housing more affordable, but let's make it so that people don't necessarily need to buy a house because renting is an affordable and attractive option. And that's why I think setting a target for homeowners is completely backwards. What you want to do is say, our target is to make housing affordable, and then people can decide whether they want to rent or whether they want to buy. I'm quite happy renting. I'm just annoyed that it costs so much money and I have so little security. I'd much prefer that we were a country like Germany where more than half of the population rent because renting's actually secure, reasonable, attractive. Um, I'm not going to go on to the part about a points-based immigration system because I've taught for quite a while, Dahlia. Um, I've seen you know a few people on Twitter get annoyed that Keir Starmer said he'd go for a points-based immigration system. I'm somewhat ambivalent. I feel like if you're going to have a migration system, then a points-based one doesn't strike me as necessarily more reactionary than any other one. Um, what's your take on that? So, I mean, firstly, on the housing thing, I think it's really important to recognize that there is now, this is a, a, a shift away from social housing model, which actually has uh, really profound effects because the whole concept of social housing is that everyone has a right to housing infrastructure. And also there was a political and a social goal to social housing, which was to have mix, you know, to have integrated social housing, which was going to create a more harmonious, you know, equal, in, in integrated society. And so as for all the reasons you outlined, you know, adding, increasing the number, the percentage of homeowners by 5% is not going to make us a more equal or harmonious society. As for the points-based immigration system, um, essentially what this represents to me is actually how far right we have gone on immigration because what a points-based immigration system essentially does is it only allows legal pathways to migration for the richest, for people who are wealthy, for people who uh, can be on jobs that can pay them enough, you know, higher than I think it's like 30,000 or 36,000 it might be, who can pay them a high salary. People who are going into high wage jobs or people who have you know, enough income to support themselves or have enough uh, pre-existing wealth to support themselves or to support their dependents. And what it, but what it does is then all of those people who come into this country to take up low wage work. Uh, so that is, you know, people who more often than not have been displaced from their own homes, uh, either as a result of British foreign policy or as a result of the activities of British companies or as a result, more indirectly, of a system that is set up to create wealth for countries like Britain at the expense of countries of the global south, those people that then migrate to Britain in order to take up jobs in the low-wage economy are forced to do that in an irregular way and therefore are exempted from uh, any kind of social service and are at the you know sharp end edge of criminalization and are heavily policed. So that is why a points-based system is a deeply reactionary uh, system because it privileges, um, you know, it basically may, means that the only legal routes to migration, the, mi the routes where you can have access to some social services, the routes where you're not constantly worried that you're going to have your workplace raided or you're going to be deported, is for the very, very, very rich. It doesn't stop the movement of low wage workers. It just makes sure, it just makes it so that their movement is irregular and is criminalized, which obviously has deeply distressing negative impacts uh, for not only the people experiencing that criminalization, but for the communities um, in which they live. Uh, so that is what a points-based system does. And that's why it's much less desirable than from a progressive standpoint than freedom of movement. Yeah, I can see why it's less progressive from a progressive standpoint than freedom of movement. But I mean, if, if freedom of movement's off the table, and I, I, I suppose for me, a points-based system, I mean, a critique I've seen is it doesn't mean very much because it depends what you give points for. But if you give points for family membership as well as money, if you give points for are you going to work in the NHS as well as how much money have you got, then it, it doesn't seem to me that it's necessarily more reactionary than any other immigration policy other than free movement. So obviously I can see why people who want open borders are criti crit criticizing this. But if you've already accepted that you're not going to have open borders, I don't really see why Starmer talking about a points-based system caused such consternation. I don't know what you make of that. Well, I think what we want, if we are going to have an immigration system, what we want is a liberal, is a very liberal immigration system with multiple pathways for 
regular migration. What a points-based system typically doesn't, obviously, you know, I mean, theoretically, you could give points for anything. But in reality, what it often means is that you give points to people who come from the upper classes, but you don't actually get rid of the root causes of displacement or the 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 gaps in the labor market that then pulls um, displaced people typically from the global south. What you do is you just create, you just criminalize it. So what I would want to see from the Labour Party is less about talking about what kind of immigration system we would have other than having a really liberal immigration system, but actually about defunding the border industry to remove and to decriminalize migration, essentially, to decriminalize, to make it so that you don't have border guards in the NHS, border guards in education systems, border guards in public services, and essentially a papers please um, society for racialized people and for migrants. That's much more tackling the fact that the British, that the way that, the, that our world economic system is set up is that we push people from economies of the global south into the economies of the global north and we criminalize that that movement despite it being integral to the functioning of our uh econ- economies in the global north but by by having that overwhelming threat of deportation and that kind of the 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 creating the conditions of desperation that irregular movement creates means that they are a much more pliable and easily exploitable workforce and so that's why um a points-based system rather than a move to actually decriminalize movement and, and not create this vast infrastructure of surveillance and bordering that permeates every part of our society. That's what the Labour Party should be focusing on rather than this talk of, of a points-based system, which in reality adds to that, that infrastructure of criminalization and privileges only um, the wel- like wealthy migrants, essentially. I'm sure this is an issue we're going to come back to. Lots of complexities there, very persuasively articulated, Dahlia. Um, let's go to a couple of comments. Laurie Hines tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Keir Starmer promises, fool me once, that's on you. Fool me twice, that's on me. Fair enough. I suppose two responses I'd say to that is, I think we we are in a situation where things such as a publicly funded energy company, like I, I can't really see why you would have much incentive to go back on that. I mean, you kind of might as well do it. I mean, also look at Joe Biden. He's a centrist. He has implemented some relatively progressive policies. I know left-wingers will be disappointed by them, but they're more left-wing than what Obama did. I think we are kind of in a different moment. Also, what I'd say is, I mean, what choice do you have in a way? If there was if there was a leadership challenge and there was a left-winger who would, was, was, was challenging Keir Starmer, I wouldn't be here saying, oh no, he's promised to make a, a energy company that's going to invest in renewables, so you should vote for Keir Starmer. No, of course I wouldn't say that. I've seen him do a leadership campaign where he lied through his teeth. Um, but that contest isn't happening right now, right? So you've got him versus, versus the Conservatives. Not ideal. Final thing from Keir Starmer's speech, peppered throughout it, were some pretty overt references to Blairism. On climate change, growth, aspiration, levelling up, Brexit, economic responsibility, we are the party of the centre ground. Once again, the political wing of the British people. The political wing of the British people is how Blair described new Labour before the 1997 general election. Sounds like the the only thing it reminds you of is the political wing of the IRA. That's sort of the only time I hear that phrase mentioned. So it does strike me as slightly an odd slogan. Um, The media classes, though, did lap it up. Sky's Beth Rigby tweeted this. Labour and its leader have changed a lot in a year. Keir Starmer heckled by the left in his 2021 speech, cheered to rafters, even as he positions himself heir to Blair. Starmer's Labour, the party of business, of aspiration, of the centre ground. Starmer more confident than I've ever seen him. Hope turns to belief. (laughs) What the hell is going on there? Uh, I feel like I don't even need to provide any comment to that because it's pretty just bizarre. Um, Let's go to the Guardian's Pippa Karan. She said this. Snap analysis. This instantly came to her. Keir Starmer finished his speech with As in 1945, 1964, 1997, this is a Labour moment. For the first time in years, the party actually looks and sounds like a government in waiting. There will be difficult times ahead, but he took a big step forwards today. And then we have Robert Peston. Um, Starmer speech 
nutshelled, interesting verb, public money for green energy to spur growth, including creation of publicly owned green power generator, Labour back in the centre ground, Sir Keir proudly working class, Labour will rescue the Tory devalued pound, enough ovations to make a dictator proud. Uh, Political journalists are really weird. <laughs> like, I don't know who do they think that's impressing other than Keir Starmer's PR team. I suppose that dictator one won't necessarily please them, although they do have some dictatorial tendencies that they don't seem particularly ashamed of. Labour MP Rupa Huck has been suspended for these comments made about Tory Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. I'm sorry if I was not making myself understood clearly. He's superficially, he's a black man, but... Again, he's got more in common. If you look at the, again, it's like Joe Cox doing more in common. If you look at the character, he went to Eton, I think he went to very expensive yeah. prep school, all the way through the top schools in the country. If you hear him on the Today programme, you wouldn't know who he's black. After that audio clip was leaked by Guido Fawkes, Rupert Huck was suspended from the party and had the Labour whip removed. This is what Keir Starmer said when asked about what had happened. In my view, what she said was racist. I'm very glad that the Labour Party, under my leadership, suspended her straight away. We took very swift action. It now does go under our rules into an, invest, uh, an independent investigation. That's the process in place for all allegations. Um, and we need to let that take its course. But um, I've been very clear, my own view is it was racist. And I'm pleased that the Labour Party acted very, very swiftly. Right thing to do. Dahlia, I want to get your take on this. Was Rupert Huck racist and was her suspension the right decision by Labour? I think it's always really weird. Like it puts you in a really weird position when an MP gets suspended for saying something that, yes, absolutely was racist, but is getting suspended by a party that is systemically racist too um, in its, you know, organisational capacity uh, and in its uh, political orientation. You know, you just have to look at the way that it's treated, you know, its first hijabi MP, um, Epsana Begum, to, to know that. It's kind of like when someone you know, owns a private jet and then preaches to people about, you know, taking too many flight, you know, commercial flights in a year. Um, but anyway, you know, obviously it was a deeply bizarre and, and racist uh, thing to say. Um, I think if I'm going to be like so generous, I think that what she was trying to say was essentially a version of the phrase, uh, not all skin folk are kin folk, which is basically like that being of a marginalized race doesn't mean that you represent the political interests of that community. You know, that, that race is obviously deeply textured uh, by class. You know, that is that famous Stephen Andon quote, which is, uh, black isn't the color of my skin, it's, it's the color of my politics. But to say that, but then again, you know, what she said was, when you hear him on the radio, he doesn't sound black, which is like straight out of the, the playbook of like a, boomer like racist dad you know it's the kind of thing I'd expect to hear like at the end of a drunken Christmas dinner and it just goes to show um really that in this country we really don't know how to speak about race and class as a connected uh thing um and and yeah just like an incredibly poor judgment and betrays a kind of really concerning uh condescending racist attitude and it's just like missing an open goal as well, you know, with all of the things that the Tories are failing at, with all of the things that Kwasi Kwarteng is, is failing at, to to get at him for not sounding black is just an, it's awful, awful. Um, and she's right to not be publicly representing Labour because that was just, it's unacceptable. Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng's plan to cut £45 billion in taxes has pushed the UK economy into freefall. The value of the pound is dropping and political and economic experts around the world have expressed shock at the government's actions. On top of that, the International Monetary Fund has said that they're closely monitoring the recent developments in the UK and that untargeted fiscal policies are not recommended at the moment. Why? Because they might work against measures already in place to tackle inflation. Oh, and as an afterthought, they'll probably increase inequality. Now, this is more than a little ironic coming from the IMF, who are usually criticised for enforcing economic policies that increase inequality. But some Tory commentators seem to miss the irony, jumping straight to full-on freak-out mode instead. Right-wing economist Andrew Lillico posted this on social media. 
Embarrassed for the IMF, this is the IMF self-declaring as a left-wing body. The UK should now withhold its IMF contributions, which would be an incredibly um, bold thing to do. Um, the IMF are, of course, famous for forcing free markets on developing economies. They are not a left-wing institution. Um, meanwhile, Tory peer Lord Hanan wrote this article for Conservative Home. So Daniel Hanan, no, the pound isn't crashing over a trifling batch of tax cuts. It's because the markets are terrified of Starmer. His House of Lords mate. So next we go to Lord Ashcroft. So he was uh, chair of the Tory party for a while. Um, now sits in the House of Lords. He said, a currency trader has just told me that a driver to sell sterling was not just the mini budget, but a concern that Labour could form the next government. So uh, this is some real solid evidence there. Um, a tweet from a Tory about an anecdote that a currency trader told him. Um, no information as to why they'd be particularly worried about centrist Keir Starmer taking the reins of the economy. Now, of course, it's no surprise um, that these right-wingers are trying to shift the blame because those who took credit for Kuateng's mini-budget just last Friday are now looking pretty stupid today. This was right-wing think tank the Adam Smith Institute crowing after the Chancellor's announcement. So they said then, we are incredibly encouraged to see so many pro-growth policies announced by Kwasi Kwarteng in the mini-budget, many of which we have advocated for over many years. Um, and then we also um, have a tweet from Robert Colville, who is director of the Right Wing Center for Policy Studies. So after that mini-budget, he tweeted this, not to blow trumpet, but Cancelling corporation tax rise, tick. Unapologetically pro-business agenda, tick. Stamp duty, tick. Opportunity zones, tick. Reversing national insurance rise, tick. Child care reform, tick. Action on energy, tick. All they need is capital allowance and it'll be a uh, CPS think tank full house. Um, these are all reputations crashing faster than the pound. The mini budget that they claimed, oh, we put all of these ideas in there now has crashed the pound and crashed the government debt market. Dahlia, it's all a little ironic, isn't it? I think if there was a left-wing think tank that had claimed, you know, a Jeremy Corbyn budget, were he prime minister, and then the pound were to crash, they could say, look, we never expected the markets to be pleased with what we were saying. The whole point was to challenge the markets. We've now got here, though, a load of right-wing think tanks. Their whole raise on detra is to say, the market is what we should trust. Let's have free markets. They've put their package into a budget, and now the markets are like, what the hell have you done? Firstly, I wish I wish that I could believe that this would mean that the BBC and other media outlets would stop quoting the IEA uh, uncritically and as if they, you know, are, are objective experts on the economy or neutral experts on the economy. But I, my faith in that being in them learning from this is not really that high. Um, I mean, it's almost as if. There was never actually a thing called a pure market that, you know, one day will deliver for everyone if it's just left alone to organically operate and to organically uh, function. But it was rather about using this idea of there being an invisible hand of the market in order to naturalize uh, the idea that the wealthy should or like just keep getting wealthier. Like the, there was this narrativistic setup, right, where you either have government intervention, um, or you have uh, allowing the market to do its thing in a way that is like natural and organic. That was always a really false opposition, right? Like in reality, governments always manage the conditions and the parameters of economic activity. The distinction is that either they can intervene and shape those conditions in a way that benefits everyday people, working people, or they can intervene on behalf of the already very rich. And so what is called free market economics is essentially about the latter. But what has happened now is essentially the British government have overplayed their hand. And, you know, to the point where the level of political political upheaval and social, you know, crisis that is likely to be triggered by these policies that are way too far um, to the right, um, is now, you know, those conditions are actually going to threaten the kind of economic stability uh, that is required for, 
you know, neoliberal, unfettered neoliberalism to, to unfold. So it's not obviously that the IMF has suddenly become socialist. It's that they have recognized that right now the British government is failing in its role to create the political and social conditions that are required for neoliberal economic activity to continue um, uninterrupted. Uh, so to me, what this really shows is that this whole idea of, you know, the free market was really a way of obfuscating the idea that governments should intervene in particular ways. And now there is a dispute over the, ex the extent to which um, that gov the government should intervene in that in a particular in a, in a particular way. So I think that the whole concept of the free market has kind of been shown up to be um, basically a narrative device rather than a reflection of an actual economic reality. I'm trying to think of what the left wing and analog would be for this. And I think it's that you've got Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, they go into government. John McDonnell fills his team with people from the New Economics Foundation, from the IPPR, maybe someone from Novara. They announce a big radical budget and two days later, the TUC calls a general strike. That's, that's kind of what's happened here. This is a real egg on your face <laughs> moment. They thought they were doing it for the markets, but then the markets gave them a big F U. Angela Rayner had a go at stand-up comedy at this year's Labour conference. Let's take a look. Frankly, conference, when I looked at the benches opposite last week, I thought the clowns had escaped the circus. Not so much flying circus, a lying circus. And then there's Boris Johnson. I do owe him one apology. I said he couldn't organise a booze up in a brewery. <laughs> Turns out he could organise a bruise up pretty much anywhere. Just a shame he couldn't organise anything else. Liz Truss has even crashed the pork market. Now that is a disgrace. <laughs> I thought the first one was cringe. The second one was like borderline, it was fine. That, that final joke was really good. I thought that was very, very well delivered, very well scripted. Dahlia, what do you make of Angela Rayner? Does she have a career in stand-up comedy awaiting her? <laughs> I mean, I think that Rayner, like, performs well on TV. I think that she's a snake. But I think that, you know, one thing that I... I do think that she is underplayed when it comes to, to the media, and particularly... Uh, I don't think that Starmer minds the fact that she, you know, snaked the left and doesn't really have clear politics beyond her own ambition. And so given that, he should be making more use of her. She's like, she's good. She's good on TV for sure. That's that's the most I can say. <laughs> and the Liz, Truss, the Liz Truss impression was good. I suppose you could say if, you, if you're a snake, it should be quite easy to impersonate Liz Truss. Um, one analysis you could land on. Um, let's wrap up there. Um, I just had to remember what day it is. It is a Wednesday, which means we will be back on Friday at 7pm. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. Good night.